I'll turn to Genesis chapter 9, would you? Start there and uh, hit a couple passages th this morning. I want to just finish up this little mini-series that we've been doing on uh, the institutions that God has set up. He set up, first of all, the family. And then he set up human government. And then he set up the church. In order for an individual to be all that God wants them to be, all three of those institutions must be vital aspects of their life. And uh, all three of us are affected by it. And the only way you will ever see God is to be a part of his church. And uh, then all of us live under human government. All of us have come from a family and in many cases our family. So those are the three institutions that God has set up. And I think there are three institutions that are under pretty severe attack. And so I want to take time just to challenge you to do further study. I did have a great time this week just doing a lot of uh, different study in this subject. I googled uh, government quotes and or quotes about human government. It was interesting to read what Thomas Jefferson had to say. It was interesting to read what George Washington had to say about human government and to go back into our uh, our forefathers here as Americans and just see a little bit, they really warned about the potential of government going sour. They warned about the risks of government. And uh, I think whatever form of government you take, and that's what's interesting in the Bible, there's no set prescribed form of government. When God set it up, he set up human government, but he did not set up a specific style of government, though he himself is a king in a kingdom. He did not prescribe that as the best form of government. In fact, in many cases, it's not because a king can be an absolute monarch. If he's not a gracious king, then it's not a pleasant thing to live under. Our form of government that has been created and put together over the span of time and the ability to look at different things is actually pro and probably the best form of government that the world has ever seen because, and we'll show you this in a couple minutes, no individual or no group, a specific group, can reign in our country. It's designed so that there's opposition parties and, and, and the, the, the partisanship that takes place is a good thing. In fact, the more partisanship there is in Washington, the better it is for all of us. When they can't get things done down there, that's a good thing, okay? That's not a bad thing, because when they get things down, done down there, that costs us out here. Uh, whatever party it is, it costs you. And so I want to take time today and do more of a lecture, if I may, and just share with you some things about human government. And look at it from a biblical perspective, because it is fascinating to look at. It's a fascinating study in Scripture, and just to see some basic concepts that I want to show you today. You see, the concept of human government was instituted in Genesis chapter 9 after the flood. Prior to the flood, there was no human government. And if you studied life prior to the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they, and, and, and they were basically party animals before the flood. It was so bad that God just wiped them out. It was so bad that God sent a flood and just other than Noah and his family, he just took earth's population and it was gone. And so what he did after the flood is he instituted human government and that takes place in chapter nine. And what God does here is he gives some very basic concepts that are foundational to life and to society and to ultimately government. And I wanna take time to show you from this passage, a couple of those things, there's seven of them, if you want to write them down, that God instituted that are interesting. And what's fascinating is this, they're still operational today. So from the time that the flood ended and God set up human government, these basic concepts that God wrote into society are still functioning and functional today, which is interesting. It, it to me, is evidence that there indeed is a God, okay? There is order and there is structure to his creation and his universe. Now, I want you to see these things. Notice verse 1, it says this. 
And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There is the first basic concept of human structure, human society. It is be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. That's what God said. As he sets this whole thing up after the flood, he said, this is what I want you to do. Now, it's interesting that as society and culture kind of move away from God, they get concerned about the earth's overpopulation, right? Yes? Now, I read, the, read just in the last two weeks reading about forced abortions in China. Because they're worried about overpopulation, we're going to run out of resources, we're not going to... Listen, it'll never happen. And I'll tell you why it won't ever happen, because God is in control of his creation. So you don't have to worry about the earth being overpopulated. We don't have to worry about resources. Uh, God took care of it. And he says to mankind, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, fill the earth. In fact, in recent studies, they're concerned that there's not enough kids being born. And they're worried about the fact that families aren't having five, six, seven kids anymore. They're having one or two. So that as you move toward retirement, there's not going to be enough of a societal base to take care of all of the things that have been promised to be paid for. That's interesting. Here's a second principle that he, he gives. Look at verse 2. He said, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens and upon everything that creeps on the ground and all fish of the sea into your hand, they are delivered. God gave authority and dominion over the animal, the fish, the birds. He gave authority to man over the animal kingdom and, and so forth. Still true today. It's funny, the more we move away from God, the more we tend to exalt that and say, well, we're just an animal too. No, we're not. We're people. God created us in his own image. We'll see that in a little bit. And so he gave us this dominion over the earth. And, and so they're worried about resources. They're worried about us ruining the earth. Listen, we need to be good stewards of what God has given to us. We need to take care of this thing. It's like you buying a house. If you buy a house, you take care of that. Well, God has given us this place to live in, this thing called earth. Do we need to take care of it? Absolutely. Should we be good stewards of it? Yes. But one of the things that he did is he gave us authority over the animal kingdom. That's still true today. Still true today. My wife loves to feed the deer. She uh, puts corn over in the one section. We can see out her one window. And, uh, and usually uh, many times in the morning when we get up, there'll be deer over there eating the corn. And she looks out and she gets all, you know, say, look at the beautiful deer. I said, yeah, I said, but a little thing's going to get shot come this uh, fall. But uh, she loves to watch it. And I said, when you go out in the porch and you begin walking over there, you know what that thing does? Gone. Why? Because the fear of you and the dread of you has been put into that aspect of creation. God did that. Look at the third thing here. This is another interesting thing. In verse number three, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Ooh. And he says, and as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. So what God did is God gave food from all of the things that move and herbs from the ground or the green things. So we eat based upon what moves or based upon what grows in the earth. And we still do today, don't we? That's the way God set it up. That's the structure that he wrote into his universe after the flood, and it's still true today. Eat your veggies, right? And then he says in verse 4, he sets something up, which by and large is still practiced today, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, it's blood. We don't eat blood today. Uh, most of the time and most of the things that you eat have been drained of the blood. Then he set that up. And then notice verse 5. He set this up. And he said, and for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning from every beast. I will require it from every man, from his fellow man. I will require a reckoning 
for, a, a, for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man's blood or by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For God made man in his own image. Here he institutes capital punishment. Here is the establishment of government right there and, and the concept of capital punishment. God delegated to mankind the right to take the life of someone who takes a life. It's interesting that in our culture we're wrestling with that, uh, probably except in Texas. Uh, if you commit murder, you don't want to do it in Texas because you will probably be put to death. I just, I laugh at the arguments. I'm, excuse me, I'm not laughing in a funny way, but I laugh at the arguments. Capital punishment doesn't deter crime. Really. Uh, that guy you put to death, he's not going to commit another one. See? He's done. He, so it does deter crime. Well, it doesn't prevent others from committing crime was never designed to it was never designed to it's kind of interesting to study the whole system of uh, punishment in the Bible our uh, our country chose to follow the Puritans in that and in doing so the Puritans basically set up a system in our culture where we believe in reformation and our entire structure in our, from our court system to our prison systems are designed to reform people. That was never true in Scripture. The Bible never set it up that way. Uh, that is an American idea. And honestly, if we're going to tip in a direction, I'm glad we tip in the direction of preserving life. I just wish that they had the same attitude toward aborted babies that they have toward hardened criminals who murder. I wish we cared about the life of the unborn as much as we cared about the life of those who are sentenced to death. Seems to be inconsistent there, doesn't it? The Bible system for crime is real simple. It's not reformation. You don't reform criminals. You punish criminals. And uh, if you steal, you pay it back fourfold. In fact, if you steal off of me, I get your check. Uh, I, your paycheck, when it comes through, comes to me. And then I get to distribute it back to you. I get to take what I need to pay back fourfold what you stole from me, and then I give you the remainder of it. So probably in that system, you don't want to steal. What's interesting in this form of reformation that we have here in our culture is we're the freest country in the world, but we have probably the greatest population in jail. Isn't that amazing? And, and honest to goodness, Reformation doesn't work. That's why it was never put in Scripture. What works is what Scripture says. If someone takes a life, then government can take that person's life. And that's basically the system that God set up. God doesn't reform us. We're not reformable. God transforms us by the power of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He doesn't reform us. It's transformation, not reformation. Now, this next thing is this, verse 6, the next one, or verse 7, he says, And you be fruitful and multiply, team on the earth and multiply in it. The idea here is work the earth for survival. Work. The idea there, team on the earth and multiply in it, is the idea of you're going to work for survival and basically we work the earth. We still do today. If it were not for the people that work the earth, we'd have a hard time with food. But there's still plenty and uh, th there's enough to go around if it's done right. So he says, work the earth. And then verse 8, the last one here, then God said to Noah, and to his sons with him, he said, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, livestock, and so on. I, verse 11, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off. And what he does here is he sets this thing up as a perpetual uh, thing. Government is going to be for all generations. So everybody that has ever lived from the time of the flood until today lives under some form of human government on the earth, right? There's no place on the earth where there's not a country. 
And there's no place on the earth where there's not a government. Every person lives under government. So God set up his creation after the flood, basically functioning by seven basic principles. They're really interesting. And every one of these basic principles are still functional and operational today. So these are the concepts by which we still live. And these concepts are in process whatever country you live in. They're, they're just operational. So, so no comment about the type of government. Human government is God's idea. Here's where he sets it up. Now, let me just give you two theological truths that are important for you to, to understand as we approach this. The first thing I want to say is this. Human government is God's gift to fallen man. Human government is God's gift to fallen man. Now, I don't know that we look at Washington, and I'm not sure we're living in America. We look at our federal government or even our local governments or whatever and say, that is God's gift to us. Uh, we may say more, that's God's plague. I get more emails about government stuff than anything else. Most of them I just delete. When I see this or that, I, just, I, I really don't spend any time reading the stuff that comes through. And, and human government is God's gift. Well, you say, wait a minute. What about those who live under oppressive uh, governments? Well, that may be God's gift to them. That is God's gift to them. Maybe they're getting what they deserve because of the way they lived. Human government, because of this, because humanity is inherently social and created for community. You were not designed to live by yourself. You are designed to function within a society. You are designed to function within a community. You are social in nature. And, and, and so most of us, when we go to work, we work with other people. Or we work for someone, or we do something for somebody. Why? Because this whole thing that God has created is social in nature, and, and it demands a, a, a community. And so communities of people need to be overseen. There needs to be policies by which businesses operate. Otherwise, you can get into a capitalistic structure where greed can take over, and that's not a good thing. Every government has its, its, its fallacy, and every form of government has its downfall. But humanity is inherently social and created for community. I was on the internet this week, uh, I had a friend that went to high school with, and uh, when the Supreme Court ruling came down this week on, on health care, uh, he posted something on the internet. And he was relieved now because corporations are going to have to stop gouging people of their profits. And uh, so I just thought, I'm, I, you know, you can sit there so long and take it, and then you just have to write something. Amen. So I finally wrote back, and I said, that's great. I'm, that's fine with me, but I just hope that they don't cut the coverage. So I did some, I, I, and, and he fired right back at me. We were going back and forth with each other, and just, it, it was good. It was, it was good. Then he said, well, he said, and he challenged me. He says, I, I bet government intervention has helped your cost there. So I, I'm like, well, I don't know. So I got on the phone with Kevin. I said, hey, Ke Ke Kevin, Kevin. I said, uh, our health care rates here at Faith have been going up in the vicinity of 15 to 30% every year over the last 10 years. It's either an 18% increase, a 24% increase, a whatever the increase is, this and that. And, and uh, so I said, hey, Kev, what did our, what our rates go up this year? He said, they went down 11%. I said, wrote back my friend and said, end of argument. I'm done. But it, it, government, that's what they do. They regulate. But why do they need to regulate? One, because we're a community and we need to live together and the common good needs to be sought. But secondly, they... They regulate because humanity is inherently sinful and needs government. It needs restraint. 55 miles an hour, right? You all obey that, right? <laughs> the ones that laugh, I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. We do, right? Needs restraint. Secondly, let me give you this theological argument. Not only does human government God give from God, but I would like to propose that law 
is God's gift to fallen humanity. Law is. Most of us chafe against law. In fact, there's a thing called the forbidden fruit principle. If, we make, if you make a policy in your house or you as a parent make a rule and tell your kids you can't do this, what's the first thing they want to do? Challenge it, right? I hate this. This is what I hate. I, I think as people, as Christians, we need to be the biggest defenders of freedom that, ex, that walk on planet Earth, right? I think as Christians, we need to be the biggest defenders of freedom that walk on planet Earth. Okay? Now I just lost my point. You're, you didn't respond and my point just went out. Here's what I hate. I hate when a group of people or an individual does something wrong and so they feel like they have to make a, a law for everybody. I hate that. You know, you gotta drive 55, okay, one per, those that don't, so they lower it to 45, like here in Sellersville, they lower it to 25, come on. See, that, so you can get carried away with law, but law identifies evil and it identifies right and wrong, correct? You know the law. Law actually restrains evil. Law is the standard by which evil is identified and judged. Law is the basis upon which government rests. Ours did this week, you saw that. I get a kick out of watching certain of the, uh, there's certain news programs that are very liberal, certain very conservative, and certain that just, some that just like to argue and fight. So when the court ruling went down this week, I was watching some of the liberal uh, programs to see their response. And of course, they were all happy, but the one really kind of hit me was really interesting. The one liberal commentator, the Ed Show, got on and said this, he was so glad that the courts ruled on the basis of the letter of the law. And I don't know a liberal on planet Earth that ever loves the letter of the law. They usually say that document called the Constitution is a living, moving document, and it needs to be uh, it needs to be interpreted based on today. You can't interpret it on the time it was written. We all know times have changed. That's liberalism, right? Times have changed. So the law, yeah, it's there, but we can interpret it how we want. They do the same thing. Liberals do the same thing with scriptures. That's how you get women pastors, just as an example. Well, we all know the Bible was written 2,000 years ago, and that was a male-dominated society. So they wrote it that way, but that's not what it means. That's liberalism. We say, yeah, that is what it means. And, and so yeah, law protects the common good. Here's what one author said. Obviously, if man were perfectly sinless, there would be no need for human government. But since every man has tasted of Adam's fallen nature, God instituted human government for the overall peace and safety of civil people. No one is above the law, including people in government. There is a, this is especially true in the United States of America because America has no Caesar. America's founders clearly understood this principle. There are concepts that have made America a great government and a great nation to live on. And let me just give you a couple of these. These are interesting. I believe that we are a great nation. Not a perfect nation, but we are a great nation because we have a constitution so that we are not vulnerable to arbitrary laws or decrees. We are ruled, the rule of law is based upon our constitution. Secondly, I believe that we are a great nation because we have a separation of powers, executive, legislative, judicial. And that is intended to prevent one person or one group from dominating the country. I think, thirdly, we're a great nation because we do not try to compel moral or religious virtue. You can be in our country whatever you want to be as long as you abide by the laws like everybody else. We don't mandate that you be a Christian. Because, and I'll tell you why they did that, that policy leads other governments to great cruelty on their part. Example, 
If most of us lived in Arab countries today, we would risk being killed for being Christians. You would live under great persecution and you would live on a great risk of dying. Why? Because those governments impose their religion. We don't do that in America. We believed in religious freedom. Well, religious freedom includes the freedom to not be religious at all. And that is one of the secrets of our country. It doesn't mandate any specific form of religion. If it does, that will lead to persecution. Fourthly, I believe that we have separation of church and state. And that protects us from interference with our spiritual work. We, as a country, have many volunteer organizations that do good all over the world. I sat this week in a, in a seminar for chaplain, the chaplaincy program, and uh, was a, it was interesting because they had there the uh, uh, chaplains from Army, Navy, uh, Air Force, uh, f- police departments, chaplains of prisons, and listened to their stories and what they were telling. And one of the, one of the Navy chaplains shared with us, he just uh, returned from uh, being out on one of our big uh, aircraft carriers with like 5,500, 6,000 people on those aircraft carriers. And he said this, he said, when we pull into port, he says, America, he said, we can do stuff in there. And he said, we take the Christians who are part of the program on this particular ship and we go into a place. And he said, we rebuild stuff. He said, because America has a reputation across the world of not just killing people, but coming in and doing good. And he was telling us, you, as you, when you go back to your churches, tell them if there's projects you need done. He said, the United States Navy will pay for it. Said, okay. That's what America does. America at its heart is still a good nation that desires people to have freedom and do good things. And they've afforded us this thing called separation of church and state. A fifth reason I think our nation is great is because we are not subjects of a monarchy. We are citizens, we are voters, and we are participants in a democratically elected governments. State, local, federal. We have a choice of officials from the sheriff to the president. We elect them. That's phenomenal. Unheard of in the course of human history. And I believe it has made us a great nation. And our government is decentralized in cities and countries or counties and states. And lastly, I believe we are great because any of you here can become a public official if you choose to go that direction. It's not limited to a specific family. It's not limited. We are a great country. Let me talk for a minute about what our government's biblical responsibilities. Come to Romans 13 and let's finish out here in Romans 13. Let me talk to you for just uh, the remainder of our time about what are, what are the biblical responsibilities of a government. And I'd like to suggest that there's three. Number one, Government is responsible, and government officials are responsible to understand that God is the ultimate authority. Look at Romans 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. God is the ultimate authority. And for governments to function as they should then I believe government must recognize that God is the ultimate authority. Psalm 33 said this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That was a reference to Israel, but it is also a principle of truth. Blessed is the nation whose God is Jehovah. The recognition of God as the ultimate authority will keep a country in balance and it will keep things in right perspective not all the time and not on every issue but by and large it's going to be a nation that will reflect the proper perspective number two i believe the second responsibility of human government is to understand that human government is delegated authority and that government officials act 
on behalf of God. Let me read that again. Not only should government understand that God is the ultimate authority, but government needs to understand and government officials need to understand that human government is delegated authority and that government officials act on behalf of God. (laughs) Man, do you ever look at your government official that way? Well, notice if you would verses, verse 1 again. Let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Now, there's delegated authority. God is the ultimate authority. He has delegated the authority to government. And it says, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. So government officials, they should understand always that the authority that they have as, as those ruling is not their authority. It is delegated authority that comes from God. And when they act as government officials and make laws and do things, they are acting as God's servants to us. That'll keep things in right perspective. Lose that perspective, then you're going to lose something. Lastly, government's responsibilities are this, to fulfill the basic functions of human government. Now, what are they? Well, I'd like to suggest four, okay? Number one, to protect its citizens. Notice, if you would, verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Government is responsible to protect its citizens. And I'll tell you what, guys. I thank God for America, because I feel like we are well protected. When I went out the other week and, and, uh, you, and took some time and went out and spent time at uh, Whiteman Air Force Base... And I got the privilege of going out and sitting in one of those B-2 bombers in the cockpit. And I looked out at that stealth piece of equipment. They have to put, they have to put covers over the edges because it's razor sharp. If you bump against that, you can just slice you wide open. It's, and these things are flying at, I don't know, they don't tell you the altitude. They're up there. And one of the guys said, that's America's big stick. That's our superiority right there. He said, one of these things is capable of doing more damage than the entire Japanese fleet did at Pearl Harbor. He said, one of these can do more than that without any nuclear weapons. Kevin was telling me about doing a mission, had to go have prayer at the operations building. He said it was like 2 in the morning. He said, I didn't know if it was a drill. I didn't know it was real time. He said, until I got to the building and the general was there, he said, knew we were real time. So he said, I went in. He said, I had prayer. He said, I found out on the news that six of those B-2 bombers flew from Kansas City to Libya, and six of them took out the entire Libyan Air Force in one mission. I feel well protected Terrorism has been a problem all around the world. Isn't it interesting that it's really, since 9-11, not been a problem in America? Our government has done a fantastic job of protecting us, and that's their responsibility. But not only do they protect us from those that would harm us from outside the country, most of us will go home today, live in our homes, and feel safe even protected in our communities from people that do us harm in our communities. It's pretty amazing. I think America has done a fabulous job here. Second thing, to protect its citizens, but to punish those who do wrong. Third thing is to seek the common good. That's the responsibility of government. And then to oversee a monetary structure, because he does say in Romans 13, as you get down to it, verse number... Five, therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For this same reason, you also pay taxes. So what you have in the paying of taxes is you have the structure of a monetary system. 
Let me quit with this. What is our responsibility to human government? I want to suggest that this passage says six things, and I'm going to do this in a couple minutes, okay? I'm going to do it fast. Number one, submit to human government as God's appointed leaders. Verse one and verse two, let every person be subject to governing authorities. When I read that passage of scripture, I just thank God I live in America and not some of the other countries around the world. It's got to be tough for believers that live in some of the communist countries to fulfill this. How'd you like to be a part of an underground church today, knowing if government officials busted into this meeting that was in private, hidden, we could all go to jail? How'd you like to submit to those authorities? But Christ gives those people living there that responsibility. Well, you also have to realize that he removes kings and he sets up kings. So submit to human government as God's appointed leaders. Secondly, recognize government's authority to inflict judgment, including capital punishment. Verses 4 and 5 say this, government can punish us if we don't keep the law. Whoever sheds blood, it's delegated authority, but you need to recognize their authority. They can send you to court. Ask Jerry Sandusky, right? Ask some of the people at Penn State who are going to get found out for cover-up. They may end up in jail. And you know what? They broke the law. They should, especially in the area of child abuse. Number three, verse number six, pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Number of, we were talking earlier before the service today, a couple years ago, we had a guy through here. His name was Kent Hoven. How many remember Kent Hoven? You know where Ken Hoven is today? Ken Hoven is in federal penitentiary. He's got a 10-year sentence for tax evasion. He should be, right? Because the Bible simply says, pay your taxes. Now, should you try and get it reduced? Should you do everything you possibly can? Absolutely. But uh, pay your taxes. Number, number seven, respect your leaders. I'd like to dwell on this for a little time. Notice what it says. It says, verse 6, for the same reason you pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. You didn't know the tax collector was a minister of God, did you? Verse 7 says, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. And I'll tell you, this one gets tough, but we need to respect the presidents, even when we disagree with them, right? I didn't get one amen on that one. You don't have to agree with the policies and the decisions that they make, but we are biblically bound to respect the office of political leaders. And we, as God's people, are to show respect to our leaders, our government officials. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I sense a little hesitancy on that one. Last thing or not the last thing, next thing, five, is we are to live lovingly and lawfully. Look at verses eight to ten. Verse eight, 8 says this. Let me find it quick. If we live, we live to the Lord. That's chapter 14. Let me get to it. It says in verse 8, Owe no one anything. The idea of that is make sure you pay back your indebtedness, except to love each other, for the one who loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Any other commandment or something of this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. We have a responsibility in this society and culture in which we live to live lovingly and lawfully, both in that passage of Scripture. Love, keep the law. And lastly, verses 11 to 14, we have a responsibility to live quietly and godly. Look at verse 11. It says this, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality. 
not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And I believe that is put in that passage for you to understand that living in the culture in which you live and living under human government, you have responsibility to live quietly and godly. Timothy said that when he said in chapter 2, he said, pray for kings and all who are in authority and high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and honorable in every way. Listen, number one, no government official can ever stop us from fulfilling our mission as a church, right? Even if they put us in jail, we're going to share Christ, right? That's China, right? If they go to jail, they're sharing Christ to jail. No government official can stop us from doing our mission, but we have responsibility. Thank God we live in America. We are to live peaceably. We are to live quietly. We're not here to form a revolution. That's why we as a church don't get involved too much in politics, because politics isn't the job of the church. Politics is national. That's what we do as citizens of the country. What we do here is we honor God. We don't come here to hear the politicians speak. We come here to hear God speak from his word, right? Live quietly. Live godly. Live lawfully, live lovingly. Respect your leaders. Show respect for the positions that they occupy. Pay your taxes. And then just recognize all this different stuff, that they are the authority that God has put in place. They are his ministers for us. Thank God for our country. Hey, you agree? Come on, you agree? I mean, good grief. Where else could, what other country could we sit around and just watch the NFL on a, you know, whenever? We have that freedom. I hope you appreciate it with all your heart. And I hope as you celebrate the 4th of July, you just say, what a great country, God, that you've given us. Problems? Absolutely. Our group's going to come. We're going to close out and sing. And as we celebrate, what we're going to do and sing, how great is our God? Because he's been great in allowing us to have this great, great uh, nation here.